Good morning. Welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Michael Talercio, pastoral intern of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. You're joining us today for day 555. We have three psalms on day 555, so three psalms, three fives, I guess, sort of works. There's a connection there, but anyway, three psalms of Asaph for this morning. And we're going to be brief. We're going to shoot to be brief here, and so we're going to need the Lord's help uh, as we spend a, a few moments in each of them. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've given us these psalms. We pray, Lord, that as we look at them, that you would speak to us from them, Lord, and that you would transform us to see your Son in our lives through your word today. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, starting with Psalm 81. To the choir master, according to the Giddith of Asaph, Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the noon moon, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him, and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. What a psalm. Oh, it, it's God telling his people that he had to give them laws that were for their own good, <laughs> especially in verse 4 there. It is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. What is? That they would blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. God actually had to institute for his people feast days for them to actually stop from their busyness of life, from the routine, from whatever they were normally doing, so that they could worship the Lord in part by eating delicious food with one another. I wonder, have you ever thought that God actually wants something like that for his people? He wants us to enjoy fellowship with one another with food. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. Now, when we take the Lord's Supper, we're taking a little bit of bread and a little bit of wine, but it's, it's meant as a paradigm for us to understand that God wants us to be in fellowship in which food is involved. I also love this contrast. He says in verse 5, uh, I hear a language I had not known. And here's the quotation from the Lord. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I delivered you. See, the Lord is setting us up through the words of Asaph here to understand that the voice of the Lord to his people in calling them out of Egypt, out of slavery, was a foreign voice to them. What they were used to was harsh taskmasters and enslavers forcing them to work beyond their means. More bricks, less straw. I'm going to give you less materials and you're going to have to create and produce more with them. That's, that's the world that the Israelites had known. And Asaph is reminding them of that because it's into that world that the Lord spoke the words that he did. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. The Lord took the burden. He took the heavy yoke of his people onto himself. And what was it meant to lead to? Well, it was meant to lead to feeding with good things. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. This is what the Lord wanted to replace their burdenedness, their burden with, with good food, with good enjoyable food. Uh, Psalm 82, a Psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. 
Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. This is a very unique psalm in a way because it has this phrase here. Verse 6, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. We need to understand the context because this verse has been taken out of context by uh, Mormons to suggest that there are many gods and that actually human beings are meant to become gods and Jesus is just one such god. It's a dim distorted view of what is actually being said in Psalm 82, but we need to understand what is actually being communicated here. We go back to verse 1 to see the context. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. There is a long-standing tradition that says that a proper interpretation of such a psalm could place demons as being the ones whom God is angry at and uh, addressing in, in Psalm 82. My personal view is that the gods is just, it's just a title meant to show the people who are in authority on earth. The authorities on earth, perhaps being influenced by the demonic powers and the devil, uh, but in either case, just kind of at a kind of straightforward way, even if that's not going on, I think that the psalm is referring to uh, those, for the rulers, the leaders over the earth, and how they are being unjust and corrupt, whether or not they're being influenced by demons. Uh, they're showing partiality to the wicked. Uh, they are being called uh, to stop and to give justice on earth, to rescue the weak and the needy, to deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Uh, and we interestingly uh, have a reference here, you'll note, uh, to John chapter 10, uh, where Jesus uses this phrase in Psalm 82 in a logical way to show those whom he's speaking to there uh, that uh, he understands the precedent of Scripture to say, if God called those gods to whom he was speaking in Psalm 82, which again is another reason why I think it's humans, are you not, why are you surprised essentially, Jesus says, that I refer to myself as the son of God, if God has used this phrase gods to describe other people? Uh, it, it's just a logical connection that Jesus uses based on Psalm 82, another reason why I think he's talking about people there in Psalm 82, uh, to say, I am the Son of God, and that's not very different than God calling other people gods. Again, this is not to say that people become gods in some mys mysterious way or at all, really, uh, in the way that Mormons have used this particular psalm uh, to argue. Uh, it is simply a statement that people are held accountable as agents of reasoning and uh, having been given gifts uh, to be agents of some sort of change or utility in the world. They are held accountable to how they use those gifts, how they use the, that those faculties that God has given to them. Um, and I think that's partly in view with what Jesus gets at in John chapter 10 as well. Uh, and lastly, we have Psalm 83, a song, a psalm of Asaph. O God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they conspire with one accord. Against you they make a covenant. 
the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also has joined them. They are the strong arm of the children of Lot, Selah. Do to them as you did to Midian, as to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became dung for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, Let us take possession for ourselves of the pastures of God. O oh my God, make them like whirling dust, like chaff before the wind. As fire consumes the forest, as the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so may you pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your hurricane. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace, that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. What I like about this psalm is its rich uh, history that it draws on from the Bible there, especially as it mentions these various groups of people, Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, uh, Philistia, those of Tyre, Asher. These are people groups uh, that are attributed to belonging to the inhabitants of Lot here. And Lot, we know, is from... Uh, the time of Abraham, Abraham's nephew, uh, he's known as um, he's known as a godly man uh, in one of the New Testament letters, uh, one of the general letters there in the New Testament. I believe it's Second uh, Peter. Um, he's he's called a godly man who had been being was being tormented um, by the ungodliness that he saw around him. Here he's being portrayed as though he kind of stands in contrast to Abraham. And in fact, in a way he did, right? Because he and Abraham separated and the descendants of Lot uh, became these people groups that kind of stood opposed to the, the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham. Um, and yet we see something interesting balanced in this text, because as we know that Lot is considered a, a man of faith, we might say, on one hand, and also kind of being in opposition in some ways to Abraham, we also see that same potential dynamic playing out in the passage because we see the psalmist Asaph here crying out to the Lord for justice as these people groups are oppressing God's people and taking a stand against them. We still see the opportunity for change to take place in such people, just like we saw with Lot, where he was living in, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, he was living amongst people who were wicked. There was still this, this germ of, uh, of the seed of hope there available for Lot uh, that we might say he received. Um, remember, he was rescued out of Sodom and Gomorrah before they were destroyed. <clears throat> and we see it here in the psalm in kind of a similar fashion where the Lord uh, is being called on by Asaph to punish uh, the wicked nations here that descend from Lot, and yet uh, he's, as he's saying things like, fill their faces with shame, he says this, that they may seek your name, O Lord. There is an opportunity for even trial, even forms of judgment brought upon people before it's too late for them to still repent and turn back and seek the Lord's face. And I think that was true for Lot. I think he had opportunity to seek the Lord who was gracious to him. I like especially that description that the Lord through the angels there uh, who, who came to, to announce the news of Sodom and Gomorrah's pending destruction to, to Lot. Uh, the Lord was being gracious to him by one of the angels taking his hand and bringing him out of the land. The Lord is continuing to provide that grace even now down through the ages as this psalm still applies. There is still pending judgment, impending. It's going to come for all of those who won't come to the Lord. And there's opportunity for us now, for all peoples, to seek his name now, before judgment comes. And we know that the Most High over all, the Lord, has revealed himself in the person of his son, Jesus. He is the descendant of Abraham, who stood uh, as the beacon of hope for all of God's people. 
He's the one through whom people could become children of Abraham in contrast to children of Lot. He's, he is the promised one who all of these psalms really are pointing to. He is the, the true God, as we saw in Psalm 81, that the people that was to be among the people. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God. See, Jesus came onto the scene and people were with the true God among them driving out the false gods as he spoke truth to people, as he healed and blessed people with the power of God. Uh, and as he went toward a cross to die, he was showing people the glory of God as he was uplifted from the face of the earth. The glory of a God who would come and rescue people like Jesus came to save. That is what we have in Christ Jesus. We have the true God who would govern his people rightly, who would give justice to the weak and the fatherless and maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. We have the true Lord who would protect his people from those who would mock and bring persecution against, against his own. He, he is the one who can actually take possession of his people and keep us from being taken possession by by wicked men. Uh, he, he is the salvation of God, writ large for humanity, and all are invited to take refuge in him now while there is still opportunity. Let's, let's go to him in thankfulness and pray. Pray that we would be agents today to talk to people, even if it's just ourselves, about these truths. And may that spill out into our conversation with others. Let, let's ask that that's what God would do for us now. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you would gift us with a look at these Psalms, Lord, that fill us with confidence in your plan, Lord, that you are not okay with the kind of evil that we read of in some of these Psalms today, that you're not okay with our own sin and our own turning away from you, that you are a God who issues forth good commandments for the good of your people, Lord, who would bless us with laws for our good. May we taste and see that you are good, Lord. May we be filled with the knowledge of Jesus today in the face of injustice around us. He is the conquering Lord. He is the one who secures your people. He's the one who demands for the good of creation that people submit to him. It is for our good that we do so. So please, Lord, may we enjoy Jesus today as we submit to him. And may that lead us to take good care of your creation, in particular people. May we care about the destitute and the needy, in particular those who are sinful and need to hear the gospel. That's all of us really, Lord. And so we do pray that you would help us to preach the good news to our hearts today. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, it's perfect timing. It was my alarm goes off here uh, for something unrelated. Um, and as my kids make a ruckus in the background, hope you will have enjoyed this look at these Psalms uh, this morning and that you'll be blessed by them as you go out into the day. Be well in Jesus Christ and enjoy him today, brothers and sisters. God bless. <laughs>